My guest today is Jamie Cato. He was in the band Faithless. He produced and directed in the epic documentary One Giant Leap. He's written a book called Insanely Gifted, which tells us how to turn our demons into creative rocket fuel. And he produced and directed the film Becoming Nobody on Ram Dass's life to make sure nobody edits out any of Richard Alpert's cosmic giggles. Jamie, it's an honor to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. So just for those who, who don't know you so well, how did you begin your journey to discovering that we can all be insanely gifted? I think um, through extreme suffering and unwillingness, you know, like all the evolution I've done in my life has none of it's been willing. Um, it's just been forced because of survival needs, you know, and I used to get horrific panic attacks when I was a young stay in my teens and twenties and stuff and had to find a way to reframe it and, and meet it somehow. And I just checked out everything from spiritual things to psychological things to global culture things, magical things, um, literature things, intimacy things, and uh, sort of just cherry picked the best of all the stuff that worked for me and discovered actually through initially just trying to survive panic attacks discovered actually that the tools I learned and the games and the techniques are actually the same for that as they are for releasing creativity as they are for discovering your intimacy in relationships as they are for sexuality as they are for parenting you know the same tools of permission and listening and curiosity and patience and courage and lightening up especially um are the same avenues to all the treasure of life so i just started teaching all the different things through those filters yeah yeah who would you say is the person that inspired you the most on your journey well obviously randas is like a, is, is you know top of the list you know he's the perfect mix of depth and unpretentiousness and comedy um you know, he's, he, no, no one puts it deeper than he does. No one nails it and says it articulately as amazing as him, but he does it with a giggle. Yeah. He does it with la laughing at his own melodrama. And so him and any other teachers that teach from the middle of the mess, you know, from the human side of it, not from the guru side, I'm down with them. Pema Chodron is another massive, um, idol. The Dalai Lama is one of them really. Um, just people that, that, that are very much about their humanity and aren't trying to pretend that they are above it and they're now teaching you. You know, the, I, teaching from one's own melodrama is for me the thing that makes everybody feel, oh, the permission, like, oh, I, I, they're just like me. Well, I, I was putting you above me, but actually you're a mess, I'm a mess, we're all crazy. You know, we feel on the inside when we meet people like that, that it's not like something that's out of reach. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned in your book that you believe that we become a generation of approval addicts with a bit of a deeply ingrained fear of criticism. Why, why do you think society's moved to this kind of value system? Well, it's just the way that we have been taught by our parents was that you get more love when you get it right and less when you get it wrong or disobey. And it just is just an unhappy coincidence that in the human bio biology and psychology that when you give something great, whether it be love or crack or whatever when you give something great and you take it away and then you give it and take it away give it and take it away that creates addiction there's nothing we, it's not like anyone was trying to do that ramdas says that you know when we're young we go into somebody training our parents know who they are they're somebody they're going to make you somebody too and that's a very yang molding you making you how i think you should be now we've learned that the yin side which is really what i'm teaching most of is just like how to be receptive how to listen how to be curious um, when you surround, when you be the space around the child, listening curiously to how it wants to be, then it will blossom into whatever is the best kind of tomato plant it can possibly be. And to get the best out of things, I found whether it be a project or a child or anything, is you be the space around it, creating the most thriving environment for it to expand, rather than the opposite, which is penetrating it and limiting it, sculpting it to how you think it should be with all things, instead of trying to do that to it, I want to sort of do that to it yeah. and give it space to expand, but, and to be very, very sort of loose about where it wants to expand. You know, it's not, the child isn't there to bring me pride or to bring me things. It's not meant to get me things. 
the project isn't there to get you money or get you feedback or you know it's there for you to be devotional to so yeah creating a beautiful thriving environment for ourselves for our projects for our children and then being very sort of um, uncontrolling about what that decides to blossom into for me is a more ex exciting and mysterious path yeah yeah but as a man who's had quite a lot of success in everything you've done you're obviously incredibly creative i just look at facebook and i just see so many young people now seeking approval judging everything by the number of likes and i speak to my kids about facebook for example and they're all about oh look i got 18 likes for this post that i did i try to explain to them that the number of likes is actually irrelevant but how do you recommend people get this message across to young people well i don't think you should the young people are meant to be developing a strong ego so that they can then let it go in their 20s and 30s you mustn't try and impose on the kids egoless values when they're developing their ego. That can be actually quite damaging. Um, you can sort of just like laugh with them about how it's not really important. Is it like I tease my kids because like all the kids these days, they have two Instagram accounts. They have their one for the public and then they have their Instagram spam account for their very, very close friends. And it's like, they're all developing themselves as a brand now. Um, and I say to them, you know, what's the difference between them? And it's like, really think about that. Like, what's the first one for, which is the slightly fake one? Like, why, why are you doing that? You know, just to question it, you know, and, and quite rightly, my, my, like my middle girl, she says, you know, look, I know it's really a bit shallow and, but this is what my friends are doing that, you know, let me do it. And then I'll discover the bits of it that are shallow and, you know, like, it's important not to impose on them egoless values too soon, but just to still make them aware of them, but not try and change it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's uh, I never, never looked at it from that perspective. Um, so Debbie Ford, I mean, you, you refer to what she said in your book saying that we're born in a castle with a thousand rooms. As we grow older, all these rooms start to shut down. How do you think we can help people to find courage to open the doors up again and kind of rediscover that buried treasure? By more and more of us becoming embodied in not taking that shit so seriously. You know, when you and I go out into the world and don't mind to be seen in our fallibility and our mess and our vulnerability and our silliness, and we seem quite happy, then the people around us will be quicker to not be wearing the mask themselves so much. And then they expand one quarter inch and then exponentially everyone starts expanding one quarter inch and that quarter inch becomes half an inch and the half an inch becomes an inch. And just little bit by little bit by just embodiment, not so much by yakking, but by just being it in the world, by having a little laugh and a giggle with the checkout person at Sainsbury's or having a bit of, you know, showing that you don't mind falling flat on your face, that person who sees it, then they'll feel slightly less embarrassed next time they fall flat on their face or they'll feel, you know, so through the embodiment of, of not being the mask, most people around us will feel less auto masked. Yeah. Yeah. And, and therefore the workshops are just about encouraging everyone to do that. We call it creating an army of walking permission slips. <laughs> well, what would you say to someone who perhaps doesn't think they're creative? My wife, uh, I say, look, do something creative so you can express yourself. And she says, but I'm not creative. What would you say to someone who says Everyone's that? Creative. Everyone's creative. It's just that they had experiences young, when they were young that shut it down, where they were told their drawing wasn't good or they were singing out of tune or whatever. It doesn't mean that they should do something creative, but it is very enjoyable and good for the system to do it. So rather than say I'm not creative, you can say, Every, you know, every child is a creative genius. Every one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old is creating all the time and exploring. So what I would say to people like that is, look, do something creative, whatever you used to do, like doing as a child, painting, clay modeling, plonking around on a musical instrument, but you don't have to show it to anyone. Most people are so kind of stuck on the idea, I'm not creative, and they're kind of worried that other people are gonna see mediocrity. Mm. And you don't have to be creative in a way that anyone else has to be a part of it. You can just do it by yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just for your own, just to spend some time doing something that's meaningless. Spend some time doing something that's just for its own sake. It's not for a gallery. It's not to impress people. It's not to make money. 
It's just because I quite like noodling around, you know, doing a mosaic, just sort of good for the brain. You know, like it's, it's the reason people freeze is because they've been brainwashed with the wrong reason for doing things, that it has to either make you money or get you good feedback. And that's actually why even a lot of creatives themselves get blocked yeah. because they, you know, your creativity is something to give your time to. It's something to be devotional to just for its own sake, like a lovely horse that you're looking after. But what people do, especially creatives, is they've been so brainwashed that instead of just making it something they're devotional to, they saddle this lovely horse like a donkey to carry their self-esteem issues up the hill or carry their money worries up the hill. And it's not there to get you. St- if, it, if it does get you stuff, that's a lovely bonus. But it's, if you think that it was a waste of time, if it didn't get you good feedback or it didn't get you money, then that's not really your project. Your yeah. project is something you do even if you weren't going to get paid, it's like something you just like doing, you know, yeah. one giant leap was born of, we just like lots of multicultural music. Let's chuck it into different combinations and see what sounds good. It wasn't like we'll make money during this. It was like, we were fascinated and in love with the African singers and the drummers and the Indian string players and the whatever. Let's try this. Let's try that. It's a kind of attitude of like when you were young, making a go-kart in the back garden out of a broken pram, you weren't actually thinking of racing this go-kart, anywhere you just wanted to see if you could do it for the fun of doing it so yeah that's really my advice to people is just do it for its own sake just because it's kind of enjoyable yeah yeah well for me that's guitar playing i i have no thought about the outcome but the actual playing it makes me incredibly happy but i don't think i'll ever be the next ed sheeran yeah but the weird thing is is that all the things i've done that have made proper money they were all side projects one Giant Leap was a side project. Faithless was a side project. Um, they're all like things people were doing to the side of what they were mainly doing because it just seemed curious and interesting. And then it ended up being big because that's what happens. Wow. Wow. I'll keep on playing the guitar then, Jamie. Um, yeah. So going back to One Giant Leap, to me, that seemed like your dream collaboration. How does it make you feel when you look back on that project? like the luckiest artist in the world really i mean you know what could be more fun than going and collaborating with everyone you love and meeting them and telling them how much you love them and making a little song with them or an interview with like my one of my favorite authors is kurt vonnegut another one is tom robbins to spend time with those people and like make friends with them what could be better really like and uh it's really helped a lot of people that film you know a lot of people still write to me and go wow it's changed my life blah 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 and um it really has a wonderful message of unity through all that diversity of multicultural stuff. And it, it, it manages to embody something that's so obvious, which is we are all, of course, not that different. We're all really moving from the same place, you know, the color of our skin, the culture. Okay. They're surfacey things, but deep down, we're all, we're all um, human. We all hope our mum's okay. We all love our kids. We all hope we're not going to be poor in the gutter. You know, we're all, not that dissimilar and the film really kind of shows that in such a beautiful entertaining way and it was a lovely experience going around the world twice doing that for the first one and the second one what about me in fact Duncan who I made it with is going to be here in about half an hour really <laughs> nice to see it. Um, yeah what I've, you know I just feel gratitude and I feel gratitude anytime anyone gives me money to do a project I feel like wow like the fact that everyone's paid to do this teacher training, it's like, wow, we're going to get to do this, you know, fab, you know, like whenever anything gets the material plane support, I feel really like wowed by that. Yeah. Yeah. So you say Duncan's coming around. Is that to discuss the third series of one giant leap? We're always discussing it. (laughs) Um, it was really special though. I mean, I know a lot of people who it touched greatly, but I, I always wondered when I watched it, it was so beautiful that I wondered if, if it was planned, you know, well, obviously you were going to get around the world and do it, but I always wondered if you knew what the, the final product was. We just, we started with um, 16 themes. Yeah. and just did as many musical pieces and interviews and shot as much imagery around those themes, universal themes, God, sex, death, money, things that even whether you're in a mud hut in Africa or a penthouse in Los Angeles, you can still talk about it. And then just gathered the best jewels 
around those subjects as we could. Then you like group together all the death stuff. You've got all these images, all these lyrics, all these melodies, all these interview sound bites, and just oh that one goes to it. Oh, that, and it just starts sort of, and then you go, oh there it is. You know, just get the best stuff and hope it all falls into place. You know. And did it change your philosophy of life that those two journeys? No, you know what those two journeys and teaching 10 years of workshops and all the mentoring and company stuff. I've realized that I, I'm, I have the same beliefs, exactly the same beliefs and philosophy that I had when I was a five year old boy. Um, I haven't changed my position since I was a, a child. It's just now that no one's telling me I'm awful uh, because of it. People I've managed to articulate it in a way that now people will, will digest it. Yeah. But, uh, I have not changed my position on nearly anything since I was a small child. I still think exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is that not because we starve as nobody then become somebody and then go back the other way to where we were? Yes. Which is again, brings us back to your kids, which is like, let them try and be somebody so that they can realize how futile it is. Yeah. 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 Let them find out through finding, feeling the emptiness of the Facebook likes and the buzz wearing off they're never going to get it through your words. They're only going to get it through the experience in the body. Yeah. It's tough as a parent when you realize that your kids have to make their own mistakes and you can't make them for them or you can't yeah. advise them though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank yeah, you. I'll tell you what's even tougher is like the amount of sacrifice, the amount of work, the amount of everything that you do. And then when they're like 16, 17, it's like, Oh, bye. <laughs> Well, it suddenly makes you realise what our parents did as well, doesn't it? You appreciate uh, your own parents once you have kids. Yeah. Oh, I, I can't do this interview without talking about Ram Das. I mean, you say you haven't changed at all, but Ram Das must have had quite a big impact on your life. Yeah, he did. I mean, he really... You know, I guess one of the main things he made me feel was that I was all right as I was, you know, like he brought me back to where I was as a child, you know, reminded me that those values of lightening up and being loving and heart open and a bit silly, uh, were, it was all right. You know, he undid stuff rather than inputted stuff. But what was it like to physically be in the same room as him? I guess not many of us have had that honor. I don't know. He's just a guy. It's just, I love him. So, I mean, what it's like is just being with someone that you absolutely love. Yeah. You know, I love the way you were looking at him. Uh, you know, you, you said he was a father figure to you, but just the way, like a, like a child almost asking him, still asking him, dad, but, but I need to know this, but why? And uh, I, to, to be honest, that was my favorite bit was to see, well, you have putting your heart on your sleeve firstly and being honest that you really did love this guy and, and not holding back with the, you know, they weren't really questions, but they were questions that a young person might ask their dad, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I knew that it was like the last chance I was going to get to ask him, you know, because he was old. Um, and there are certain things in the spiritual path that I just want him to clarify because he clarifies things so well. And, uh, you know, like this idea that there's no self, you know, stuff like that. It's like, what, well, you know. Um, and really, he just treated me with so much compassion and love. And he can see that I was spoiling for, for a promotion. He could see that, like, partly I'd come there to get anointed and, you know, to be told I was his successor. Um, and he didn't play that game with me, but he was just, like, very loving, saying, look, you think you're trying to get to the big boys' table, and I'm telling you, you're already at the fucking table. Do you know what I mean? Like, the only thing that's keeping you from being an equal with me is your idea that you're not. Yeah. 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 And I think we all have someone in our life where we have that issue where we try to step it up to be their level, but we're, we're already there. We're, we're souls. Aren't we? Yeah. yeah. I, one of the answers I've listened to a lot of your interviews in preparation for this. And one of my favorite things you talk about is the men and women, although we'd like to think we're not different at all, that actually, um, women are, well, you call I think you described them in one interview as a stargate to the universe um, and they, they have this special magical kind of aura about them that men can never get close to. Would you talk a little bit about that? Cause I, I thought it was fascinating. 
Yeah, we, we've got this workshop on the 5th of July called Men and Women Healing the Wound of the Planet. Um, if you go to jamiecatto.com forward slash workshops, join in that conversation. I do think, I mean, I can't say because I'm only a man, so like, I'm not a woman, you know, but I do think women have a kind of magic in them that men need. And men are going to, you know, like it's almost like an addiction, like men need that magic, that radiance. And that's why, sadly, there's been so much abuse of women because it's like it's so they're so addicted to it that the the overpowering male dominant thug is like, listen, either you give it to me willingly or I'm going to take it. But either way, I'm not going to live without it. And that's kind of like how it's been, mm. uh, sadly. Um, but I do believe that a woman's radiance, a woman's sexuality, a woman's magic affects men in a way that man's magic doesn't affect women you know i think there's a, an unevenness there like we are more affected by them than they are by us yeah. hence hence the commodifying of women's sexuality and radiance it's there to sell everything you don't you know i just we just took we just moved into a new house we got our box of cutlery and on the back of the cutlery there's some woman sort of with a spoon half out of her mouth you know like looking yummy and it's like literally women's sexuality and beauty will be used to flog anything even cutlery you know like yeah yeah um, so i do believe that there is a difference in what women are putting out and um and men need to be worthy of it you know like we need to um you can't skip the steps of the forgiveness and apology for the amount of abuse that's gone on from men towards women whether it be silencing them, abusing them, raping them, controlling them. Um, it w we are also, there's a beautiful new generation of men who are embodying their service and their leadership through love and, and service. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of wonderful men. But these men can't be led back to the women to a warm hearth until we can't skip the step of all the healing that needs to happen. And like, like Mandela did in South Africa, after apartheid, they had a whole load of meetings across the country of truth and reparations. Um, we need something like that. And we're trying to package a, a, a thing like that so that men and women can have a lot of meetings. That's one of the things going to happen on July the 5th. So that men and women can have a lot of meetings where, where there's apology, where there's acknowledgement, where there's forgiveness. So that the men, so that we can't skip that healing step and then the men can be welcomed back. Uh, but you can't just say, oh, sorry, and, and now it's done. You know, like, there's every reason in the world for women in their cells, in their ancestry, to not trust men. Mm -hmm. um, look at what they're still happening to the planet. I believe what women, men have done to women is the same as what men are doing to the planet right now, raping out the taking, taking, taking. Now, it's not totally one-sided, of course. There are women who have also abused their power over men. There are women who you know the way that the mothers have raised the sons there's a whole conversation to be about that that you know there's a castration there's a there are problems there's problems on both sides but it's not even i'm not saying it's totally one-sided but it's absolutely not even mm. Mm. the first thing that needs to happen is there needs to be forgiveness of the men um and the men need to in a way earn that forgiveness yeah um, and there's going to have to be another level where there's an acknowledgement on the other side of the other abuses, but you may not be able to do them both at once. And I think the priorities <laughs> is the, is the women needs to be healed first. Yeah. That leads me on to, I mean, the world right now has been shaken by lots of different subjects, COVID-19, climate change, the death of George Floyd. Where do you believe the threshold lies between activism and fighting for a cause and letting go and just letting be in that kind of spiritual context? I think you should fight for the cause and you should do it on a twin trail where you do your inner work in parallel with it. Because if you just fight for the cause without the inner work, you just have another angry, I'm angry with my daddy. You know, like you, you're not going to be efficient to do the inner work where you clean out your own corruption, you clean out your own hypocrisy, you clean out the other, the, 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 the knees you've had on the necks of other people, the dishonesty, the corruption, mm. and then fight the cause cleanly with love, firm love, tough love, sometimes cutting out the cancer love, but love. 
and not judgment and shaming and you're disgusting and you need punishment and vengeance. That, that's not got no place in the fight for justice. We need to rebuild the new world out of love and out of patience and out of healing. Um, so we don't want to be punishing people. We want to be showing them where they're lost, showing them where they're ill. I believe that, and this is not going to be popular with everyone, but you know, I believe that all abuse, all abusers are really ill. They're not, they're not bad. They're not like they were once a lovely baby and they might have brought through some ancestral stuff, but essentially I'm pretty much sure that most abusers it's nurture. It's, you know, it's, the signals and bad education that they've been taught to normalize through their lives and picked up from their parents or picked up from their peer group that allows dehumanization and abuse. And I think these people who are ill with that bad data, they need high security hospitals, not prisons. We shouldn't be shaming those people and saying they're disgusting. We should be like, I mean, be outraged, act, stop them, take them off the streets, but but send them somewhere where they can be educated and healed and process the wounding of their abused childhoods and fucked up education rather than write them off as bad and, and then create a duality of the goodies and the baddies. Because if we do that, we're going to just create another self-destructive system, I believe. Yeah. yeah, that's the risk that more barriers go up than come down, right? So with your vast experience and with all your wisdom, after all you've done with your music, your filming, your workshops, and all the speed people you've spoken to, how are you being righteous and judgmental on a daily basis? I'm exceedingly righteous and judgmental on a daily basis. I just try not let it leak on other people. Okay. I don't think you can stop being righteous and judgmental. And you just got to just like notice that voice because, and then and feel underneath it for the legitimate need, which is, oh, I need to soothe my sense of powerlessness. I need to soothe my sense of alienation. I need to have more conversations with people of different colors and people of different backgrounds and stuff. Like, I need to bring what I think is lacking in the world. Marianne Williamson said that, you know, the only thing that can be missing in any relationship is what I'm not bringing, you know, whatever I'm feeling self-righteous about, how can I bring more of the goodness to my community, to my family? If I'm problem with corrupt people, how did I just lie about something even small mm -hmm. to get away with it? Or like usually the things we're upset about, not always, but there's always a takeaway for us, you know, and just like somehow transform that, keep the judgment of, yeah, that's wrong. That's not okay. You know, keep that but the hatred and vengeance and sort of bitterness that comes up underneath it, that's mine to deal with. And as long as I can work on that, then I can act passionately for the things I think are wrong rather than destructively. Yeah. Wow. Very wise answer. Thank you. Um, is there anything you would like to say just before we go, anything you feel that need, is coming from the heart that you want to pass on? Just everyone, please lighten up on yourselves. You know, any voices you have that you're treating yourself with exasperation, treating yourself with self-loathing, who am I to do this, belittling yourself. Anytime you notice that voice, it means the real you is asleep. It's, it's not you. It's stuff you've picked up. Please treat yourself kindly. You know, like you deserve just as much kindness as everyone else. Not an enormous amount, just an average amount of kindness. Please lighten up on yourself. If you notice yourself treating yourself badly, stop. Rub your chest. Treat yourself with kindness. You know, of course you're a bit of a twat. Everyone is. <laughs> but just lighten up on this big self-flagellation thing. And yeah, come to Transforming Shadows on August the 1st if you want me to show you how. And to do that, they go to www.jamiecato.com. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been an honor speaking to you. And Love hopefully get to come to one of these workshops uh, one of these times. I'm in France. Welcome. If you ever want to come over to Switzerland or France, then we'd love to have you over here. Book it, baby. <laughs> okay, we'll get that sorted. <laughs>